This is the unit tests are dead talk. We're in the wrong room. <laughs> um, so it's good. It's a good turnout. This is, I don't know if people are strong unit test advocates or if you hate unit tests and you just want to see all of them. So the second part of this, the second aspect of this is. Uh, is uh, how observabil observability promotes, if I can say observability right now, it's going to be found off, uh, promotes a, a DevOps mindset. And that's sort of the, th this is sort of geared towards my learnings over the last few years. Uh, so a lot of the, the slides in this are probably going to sound like, uh, like sort of preachy and stuff, but it's not sort of me talking to myself going through a lot of these uh, discoveries. Uh, so I'm going to start off with a bunch of questions. I just want to try and figure out crowd here. Uh, there is no wrong answers, uh, and these are going to be super fast. So just put your hand up, you're going to get your arms going to get tired, it's going to be going up and down all over the place. So let's try a few things. Unit tests are critical to stable code. Okay. Uh, unit tests are critical when we're factory. A lot more. Okay. Unit tests let me sleep at night. Okay. Integration tests let me sleep at night. About the same. Uh, we have staging environments. Most people have safety environment. I trust my safety environment. <laughs> <laughs> integration tests are too slow. Okay. Integration tests require too much setup and teardown. Okay. So what's the right mix? Uh, a, a couple of unit tests for a lot of code, or about 50-50, or a lot more unit tests? A, B, C, quite a mix. Coverage, everything should be tested. A little bit tested, about 50 50. Uh, way over tested, or way under tested. People still enjoy this out of that one, I guess. Um, how long does it take for you to write tests? You, you find you write about less, less of your time writing code or writing tests, or you spend more of your time writing tests than you do writing code? Okay, my team actively manages the production system. So you've got stuff out there running, user statement. Anyone on call right now? <laughs> Let's hope our phone's on call. Uh, we use a continuous integration system. And when I say continuous integration, I mean um, that it's gating. So stuff can't get into master uh, unless it passes. So um, automated deployment. Okay. Uh, testing is QA issue. QA group. <laughs> oh, I believe that. Wow, that's impressive. Um, we depend on an operations team. Not so much. We have a monitoring alerting system. <laughs> My phone. <laughs> okay. Uh, our application is instrumented. We use all that stuff. Fully. Okay. Uh, we have a strong DevOps culture. No. Okay. Thanks. Uh, and I lied. There are completely wrong answers. <laughs> um, so uh, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Sandy Walsh. I'm a software developer. Uh, when I graduated, I, I went through all the sort of managerial tracks that I thought were important for software development. Uh, you know, project lead, team lead, directors, VP, CTO, all the way up through. And then around 2005 or so, I just said I'm done with managing people. And I went back to writing code, which is what I really enjoy. Um, and uh, it took me a couple of years to get my knife sharp again, but after that, you know, got back into it. Got into the OpenStack project uh, in the early days with Rackspace. And, uh, uh, and now I'm working with a company called Plan Lab, we'll explain that in a little bit. Uh, but also I thought, in addition to this, it might be interesting to look at some of the other stuff. So I've worked with, you know, mostly C, C++ in the early days, got, went through a stint to Java, spent a long time with Python, last year or so I've been focused on Go, which has been an interesting transition. Um, but also from the methodology point of view, I started off sort of before you know, graduating called Waterfall, but then we got quickly into Spiral, which was a, an early iteration of, of XP, which was extreme programming, um, and then into Scrum, of course, which we won't talk about, the, sci the Scientology of methodologies. Um, and then, and now I try and focus a little bit more on, uh, uh, on Kanban, which seems to work a bit better for our environment. And I, I think the important part of that, when I was going through this, thinking about it, was that that's where this sort of unit test mentality sort of came in, right? Which was the idea that if testing is hard, test all the time. So um, that's that's where we got into you know test driven development and 
acre for urban development and automate all the things and stuff. So uh, maybe that's why a lot of money thoughts about this are so ingrained. But uh, so now we're working on something called Planet Earth San Francisco. We make CubeSats. We've got the biggest constellation of CubeSats in the world. We've got about 180 of them flying around right now. That's an actual satellite. Um, so we make we make them. We design them. Uh, we use an agile methodology for satellite development as well. Almost every satellite is different than the next one. Um, try a bunch of different things. We throw them out of windows out of the International Space Station, or we send them up on rockets. So they'll either go through. Um, uh, International Space Station orbit, or they'll go through sun synchronous orbit. Uh, so basically, it's a line scanner for the planet. Every day, we take about you know, we take photos of the Earth. So here's one that's in here. Just took that the other day. So just grab that one from the other day. Um, and uh, we take about 1.5 million photos a day. Like I said, it's like a line scanner. It goes right around the planet. Uh, and the sizes range anywhere from like a flak file to a Blu-ray disc. Um, so it's pretty cool stuff. Uh, but our pipeline is kind of interesting. We have our, our satellites up here, which uh, send down to our ground stations that are all over the world. And then they pump data into the Google Cloud. Uh, and then we go through our image processing side of it for rectification. Any, any geo people here? OK, good. I'm the same way. <laughs> uh, so we, we go through all these this complex geographical processing on the data. So we've got like 30,000 instances in there, just big jobs to take like a data run, crazy stuff. They all go into a catalog, and then we have our sort of application layer on top of it, Kubernetes, uh, tile server, I'll say. So if you use Google Maps, you see those slippy maps, you know, the little rectangles that sort of go around. Those are tile servers, uh, so we make those as well. I'm responsible for, uh, uh, the team that I work on is responsible for a thing called the ordering system, so if you want to order stuff, this is how, how, we, uh, how we access it. We're going to come back to that diagram quite a bit, because that's a key thing up, I think. Um, so they read the intro to the talk. Um, we were having a few beers after work, and we were talking about unit testing. And someone said, "Oh, unit tests! You know, they hated them. They said it's like you took your code and put it in a barrel, and you fill the barrel with concrete, and then it's locked in, you can't do anything with it." And I was just um, gobsmacked. I just come off the OpenStack project, which is a, a large cloud fabric. Um, uh, open source project, and it was very test heavy. So you couldn't submit code that lowered the coverage rate in any code or anything. Uh, so my my world had fallen apart. Um, you know what's wrong with unit testing? But the more I thought about it, uh, it I was starting to wonder: like, do these unit tests really give me any comfort? Are they really making my life easier? And the answer was no, not for the amount of work that I put into it. I mean, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time making really beautiful, awesome unit tests that have great coverage, and it's not helping. When I look at this stack, I see all the things that can go wrong in red, and I think, you know, my piece of it is just a little tiny piece of it, and the unit tests aren't helping me with that side of it. So in my head, I'm thinking, all my tests are passing, the code is correct, but the world around it is crumbling. So what am I going to do about this? Uh, if you're in production, you've got a monitoring system. It's already there. You've got to have it. Right? Um, so if I've got a monitoring system or I'm going to have a monitoring system, why don't I just start using it now and ease up on these unit tests that aren't giving me the bang for the buck that I'm expecting? Um, I can spend a couple of quick minutes on uh, definitions and stuff because I know everyone has different interpretations of this stuff. Unit tests, I'm talking about testing a particular function or method. Uh, and when I do unit tests, I'm um, hardcore on it. I test every branch, every in, every out, every dependent structure. I mock them out, I fake them out, I do all the tricks to really lock down those unit tests. They work great, uh, except for dynamically typed languages. If you're in Python or Ruby or JavaScript or something like that, um, unit tests I find just anyway are just bad because it's the boundary conditions where things break. Uh, which gets you, sort of pushes you into the functional test realm anyway, where you have to test across methods. And now your tests are getting a little bit more complicated. The setup and teardown, your fakes and your mocks are getting a little bit more complicated. Um, so you're sort of sacrificing readability when you get into that side of it. And then the last part are integration tests. And there's sort of two mindsets for integration tests. One is that we have staging environment and we actually hit it and it mimics production. The other one is like, we're just going to mock out everything. We're going to mock out the data database, and we're going to mock out all these different things, and everything, and we're going to run our tests against that. And that's—I'm not talking about that side. I don't 
that sort of glorified functional test. Uh, so I'm talking about, when I talk about integration tests, I'm typically talking about a sandbox environment. And it's meant to mirror uh, production. The reality is that typically staging never matches production. Um, so that, that's really your call if you, uh, if you trust your staging environment, which I see as a little bit. Um, so again, kept going back in my head. My unit tests are just so good, why is page duty going on at 3 o'clock in the morning? Um, what I'm proposing is something like this, where there's a very, very small amount of unit tests uh, for very critical things, and we'll talk about those applications, or those specific cases, and my code, and then we have this monitoring infrastructure. And I know you're looking at this going, well, that looks a lot more complicated, like, why would I want to do that? You're going to need that anyway. If you're in production, you need this stuff. And this is the observability realm, which I'll talk a little bit more afterwards. Um, so monitoring, tracing, structured logging, event management, ties in with your CI CD system, you've got dashboards on top of it that make it all look pretty, you get alerts that go off on your phone when something goes wrong. Um, that's sort of the realm of DevOps. So DevOps, uh, if you're not familiar, um, is not a tool, it's not a set of tools, it's a mindset. It's that handoff between the operations group and development uh, and working back and forth with those groups to make sure that software gets released at a proper cadence and reliably and repeatedly. Um, basically, you don't throw code over events. Right? And we've seen this before in the early 2000s with QA. Right? There used to be a QA group, you write your code, you throw it over to QA, they beat it up, they file tickets, come back, and typically that cycle will take a few weeks. And then as we got into TDD and unit testing and stuff, we started to see those lines sort of uh, blur between QA and development. Uh, so that's the same idea with operations. So what we're seeing now as we move towards more service architect uh, service oriented architectures and uh, software as a service is that you start to see the rise of the service owner. So within these groups you start to see little pockets where not only are you a software developer but you also have to worry about the care and feeding of the service that you're building. So again, I look, I look back at this little, my corner of the world, and I look at my unit test, my functional test, my integration test, and I go, that's, out of all those things, the integration tests, even though they're brittle, something changes in the application, and now my integration tests all break, but they let me sleep at night. I know, even if I just do integration tests on the happy day scenarios, you know, golden files or whatever, that I can get some reasonable level of comfort with this thing. So uh, again, my, my little corner of the world in here, uh, I can't think about that anymore. I've got to think about how it fits into the whole stack. So imagine having an, a, an amazing QA team that can come up with all kinds of really creative ways to beat up your application constantly uh, in ways that you could never think of. Right? That's your users. Right? <laughs> and you can't make something an idiot group because it is so ingenious. Um, so a lot of people think when you, and, and I went through the same thing, is that when you first start to think about that, it's what they're going to see are mistakes. You know, we're going to have egg on our face and it's going to look bad. Uh, but they're going to see them anyway. You're going to make mistakes. Stuff is going to break. Stuff is going to fail. And the question is, is how quickly can you respond to it? Do you want them to see the bugs and you don't know about it? Or do you want them to see the bugs and you know about it? You know that something went wrong. So these are, these red slides are sort of what was going through my head about like what, um, what I didn't want to do, right? So I've said, okay, I'm pretty well done with the unit tests, except for the really specific pieces of non-resource dependent code that uh, it's complicated or it's got some real business logic in it that's important, and I'm going to focus on those things. So that, that really awkward piece of code that you keep stubbing your toe on, like permit everyone in the finance and sales group except for Bob, you know, and, and every time someone makes a change to the code, something breaks, that sort of stuff. I'll probably keep some unit tests around for I'm not going to worry about test coverage. I'm not going to worry about testing every conditional. I'm not going to worry about configuration or setup code. I'm not going to worry about fence post errors. I'm not going to worry about validation and response code. I'm not going to worry about general error handling. I mean, I'm going to do it, obviously, but I'm not going to sweat it with unit tests. I'm going to worry about the stuff that's the most important. I'm going to worry about where regressions occur. Um, I'm going to worry about that complete, complex piece of code that at three o'clock in the morning when I'm trying to understand what's going on with it, it's totally readable and makes sense. I want to test for that. Um, but that's where I'm really, really going to try and, uh, and, and spend my time. And we've all got technical debt, right? All of our code is crap. I look at my stuff and it's six months old, I go, what was I thinking? Um, 
but that's the nature of it. So I'm going to make my unit tests laser focused, readable, small, very few of them, and they're going to work great in CI. Um, because you've probably seen the old like, KCD uh, cartoon about compiling, right? Well, now it's ready for <coughs> CI pass, right? And that's, uh, you know, wow, well, I've, I've submitted my full request, and now I'm going to wait an hour for everything to go green. Well, that doesn't help you when, some, when I've got to wait for an hour for the gate to pass, and I want to get something fixed in production. So I want CI to be super quick, super fast. And in some places, I didn't, here's the point. That's what we do afterwards, right? When I can't wait, I can't wait for an hour for CI, so I'm just going to roll that container out right now and cross my fingers. So, like I say, in the early days, it was testing this, uh, you know, for extreme programming. Uh, the mantra was testing as hard as you test all the time, and I think the DevOps culture is test production all the time, right? Because the ops people, who are the ops people? Right, one in the back, all right. Oh no, over here, good. So I mean that's you know the two thousand year Vietnam stare is always coming out. They've they've seen the they've seen the atrocities. So this is where we sort of get into the this idea of the observ observability. I think that's the last one I'm going to say. Um, so like I say, it's not just tooling. There's these sort of five pillars of monitoring and observability that are important: monitoring instrumentation, structured logging alerts, dashboards. That is the tool set was not about the tool set, it was about that handoff between ops and dev and being able to share that observability, that monitoring between both of your systems. Uh, so some terms here, uh, because obviously I said monitoring, I said instrumentation, I said you know telemetry, all these different things. Let's just get some, some baselines down. Telemetry is just like our satellites, they send information about how they're doing all the time. You know, I'm cold, I'm hot, my batteries are good. Getting the sun, whatever. Um, so it's transmitting information about a piece of, uh, about a, a, usually a scientific instrument. Monitoring is actually looking at those instruments. You know, what are they spitting out? What are they, what's, what's the water level in the, in the lake? You know, something I need to worry about. So monitoring typically has been in the domain of ops, right? Everyone's seen the Nagios screens and stuff, and, and Kirsten screen got at them. Um, and they would typically measure stuff like CPU, disk space, number of 500s, number of 400s, you know, the size of the queues, those sort of things. And that's, that's sort of an outside observer looking at the application. And observability says, we want to know why these things are happening. This is, these are uh, canaries in the coal mine, and we want to figure out what's actually happening with our application. So we want to be able to measure the internals of our service and share that with, with ops so that the DevOps mindset really works both ways. The stuff that I want to test, the stuff that I want to emit for my application, here are all those little pieces of code where you kind of go, you know, you've seen the comments, if, you, if you've looked gone, if you look the word fuck in GitHub, you know, you've seen like, why is this happening? Like that's that's the place where you want to land a track, right? Um, you know, this, I should never reach this line. <laughs> Great place to put <laughs> So, you know, the number of retries that have occurred, that's a great leaking indicator that something's going to go wrong. First retry, second retry, third retry, that should be on a dashboard somewhere. You should be finding that out, you know, because that's something that a unit test is not going to help you with. Um, you're falling back to a default. Um, I was supposed to get this parameter, I didn't get it, but I'm going to use the default of 10 because I just pulled it out of thin air. That's the stuff you want to put a metric around because that's the stuff that, well, normally it shouldn't happen. Sometimes it does. Uh, top level exceptions. Um, Sentry, um, New Relic, any users with some of those products? Yeah. So, that, I mean, that's typically what they do. They catch top level exceptions and they report it out. That's like the early days of, of uh, monitoring and telemetry. And they're all moving into this space now. There's, and there's a ton of products out there. Uh, there's open source ones like Prometheus, or Datadog, Signal Effects. Uh, all the cloud providers have them. You've got Stackdriver from Google. You've got AWS CloudWatch. There's, and they're all moving into the space. Uh, so don't build them. <laughs> I know there's a bunch of developers here. Like, oh, I can make a telemetry system on the back. Don't. They're all, they're all out there. And the previous one is really slick too. Um, so let's just talk a little bit about monitoring and, and, and telemetry and, the, and those five pillars of the stack for a minute just to get everyone on the same page. Metrics are those little signals that you're sending up every now and then that, that says how your application is working. So you've got counters to say, like, this just happened, and it gets 
aggregated up. You've got a rate. This is how fast I've been seeing this thing happening. Before it goes a gauge. What's my CPU level? Right. Out of, out of 100, you just transmit that up. Um, then you can do rolling averages over time, histograms. Uh, so those things are really handy. Typically, the way you roll this out is that you have a little. Uh, you have a little aggregation service that typically runs next to your application, stacks the, uh, collect the, there's a bunch of different ones out there. And then your service sends little UDP packets out to it. And then these things roll it up, and every 10 seconds they blast it out to your main application um, for reporting and dashboards and all the rest of it. You, you don't want to send from your service right to your telemetry system with HTTP or anything like that because monitoring can't bring down production. Monitoring goes down and you're dependent on it, then that's a black hole and everything just falls into it. Um, so non-blocking operations, that's why we use UDP. Uh, there's, this is, and these are small little packets, that's typically what a packet looks like to say number of users online. And then there's, uh, Datadog has an extension to it called DogStats, which allows you to do tagging on it as well. And that's important because typically when you do metrics, Historically, the way it's been is you would say something like myservice.live.china.usersonline. That's how you would basically make your hierarchy out of it. That gets a little clunky after a while. So the better way to do it is if you say like myservice.usersonline and you tag it with the live environment, this deployment environment that I'm going out into live, and then the region that I'm deploying into, which is China. And now these um, values that have low cardinality, you, you wouldn't want to put like a UUID or something in it. That's a high cardinality value, and those are hard, hard to sort of flip through and you keep it in your head. But these low cardinality things are great for, for differentiating your metrics. There's also a pull model, which Prometheus sort of promotes, which is a telemetry, you have to expose an endpoint on your application, and, to, and the telemetry system will come into it every now and then and say, what do you got for me? And you just grab, and it grabs all the metrics there. So that's a, it is an HTTP call, but it's a pull model. So it's not, you're not blocking on it, and it's, it's not as invasive. It's an interesting strategy, there's some good and bad for it, um, but it's a nice way to go. So, uh, metrics are lossy, they're gonna get, there's UDP, they're gonna get dropped on the floor, you're gonna lose them, you don't be dependent on it, you don't, you're not gonna build against telemetry data uh, because it's uh, important, there's no context, really, it's just a thing that happened, and uh, little tiny payloads. When you wanna get into the more complicated stuff, you get into things like distributed logging. So, how many, um, how many people are using structured logging? So structured logging is uh, you know, historically logging like Apache logs, space delimited or time delimited log files, right? Um, structured logging is typically like a JSON entry. You can send it up so it's machine readable, it's easily parsable, and you can do some really cool stuff with it. Um, and you can send all this stuff up, you know, TCP, UDP, but basically you're taking all of your systems and rolling all your logs into one place. It's no longer this idea of having terabytes and then having to find the server and then crack all the terabytes and look for the right log file and hopefully you get it. This is something that goes spans all your systems. Um, there's a header you can put in there, um, which is gets you into tracing, so you can put a span ID and things, and so the first time you see a request, you can pass that along to other services as well, so you can link these, these log messages. And that's when you get into tracing. This is like your tracer below that goes right through all your services. You don't do it all the time, you can probably do it a very small percentage of the time, but at least then you're gonna see latency between systems and stuff. So, if I want to see how a call comes in from a user and goes through our edge or ingress, and then goes through my system, and then goes in through our G4 system, and through Kubernetes, and then all the way down to Google Cloud, I can do that with a trace message. Find out, you know, did I get a regression on latency across all the systems? Very handy stuff. Historically, people would use an Elk stack for this, right? That it would be log stash, uh, Elasticsearch, and Cabana. And you can stand it up yourself and you can manage these servers. And anyone who's had to manage an Elasticsearch cluster knows that it's a horrible nightmare. Um, so you don't have to do this anymore. Five years ago, yes, stand up an Elk stack. Now these things are done a dozen. There's new companies coming out of it all the time. Just a dumb one. And if you're on a cloud platform, but the, the Google uh, stack driver one is awesome. Uh, you can do some really, really cool queries with it. And it's tag based as well. And then finally, you get into the dashboard, the top level of the monitoring. Right, which is the pretty pictures. Your charts and your graphs and your high lows and your, and your traffic lights and all that. And then you have the integrations out to all your Slack channels and pager duty and all the rest of it. And you get stuff like this. And that's what I have on my screen all the time now. That's 
that's the one monitor that's dedicated and it just sits over there and I see it when I get up in the morning, I, you know, get my first cup of tea into me, look at the last 12 hours, find out where the blips are, find out what happened, and that gives me an assurance. And if, if you're a unit test person, you're probably familiar with these old dashboards, right? Which was your J unit runners, right? And you know, the old mantra was if, it, if, it's, if it's green bar, then you ship it. And this is very primitive now, looking back at it. So, green slides. These are the things that I wanted to, uh, uh, can you look here? I'm trying to find a good mm -hmm. shape. So these, are the green slides are the things where I said, okay, this is what I'm gonna do going forward. So I, I already established all the things I didn't want to do. Let's talk about the things that I do want to get good at. I want to get good at deploying. I want to be able to deploy and roll back quickly. And Kubernetes users? Cool, yeah, I mean, that makes life just so much better for this. So you can put the power in the hands of the developers take care of their own rollouts and stuff. You don't need a big CD environment. CD sort of drops off a little bit when you get into things like Kubernetes or any of these sort of managed container systems, uh, which is awesome. So that, that part of it got a lot easier. Uh, establish an on-call rotation, even if you're not in production, even if it's just an internal team. Get everyone on the team up to speed with it. Let them know what's going on when something's not working right. Um, you're gonna need one anyway, so you might as well just get started with the process now. And it helps you shake out those those noisy alerts and things, right? When people get annoyed by the thing that's buzzing all the time, that's the thing, the squeaky wheel gets greased, right? Uh, I'm gonna let monitoring and alerting worry about everything else uh, that I'm not testing directly. That's hard to let go. Um, because, and the, and the, for me, the rationale was if, I, if, I, if we focus on monitoring, then we're gonna focus on percentage of stack as opposed to percentage of code. And percentage of stack is ultimately what's, what's important for production. And as software developers, I, I, like, I know it's easy to hide on that side of the wall. The old adage was, uh, our job as software developers is to ship. Um, there's a great quote um, by CJ, which is, uh, shipping your product feels good, like when someone stops hitting you. Your job is cleaning the product, fixing the bugs, and shipping. The bugs need fixing, fix them. The documentation needs writing, write it. Code needs testing, test it. All of this is part of shipping. You don't get paid to program, you get paid to ship. And it's true. I mean, that's what we had to do. But now I think it's changed a little bit. Our job is to ship and to keep the ship afloat. That's the service owner sort of thing. So if we help ops, they're going to help us. And the more that we can expose our application and share those dashboards, then the better. And this is um, and this is working out well for me anyway uh, in, in making that move out of dev, uh, the dev silo. So, like I said, you want to see a bug get fixed, put an alert on it. And that thing is buzzing and driving everyone off the wall. What's the first thing that's going to happen on Monday? That bug is probably going to get fixed. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's easy to do. If you've already got warn messages and error messages, log messages in your code already. That's a great place to start. Anything that's a warn or, or an error message, put a metric on it. And then you're going to get some sort of feel about what's happening. A lot of those things just get. How many people periodically like, or regularly go in and look at their logs and look for errors and stuff? Oh, good, that's better than most. Um, but uh, once you've got it on the dashboard, it saves you those extra steps, right? Automate, automate, automate. And a nice little telemetry library can really help you with that. Um, that if you're going to write some code, that's the piece you want to write. Write a nice little module that has all your company defaults in it, your API keys, and make it super simple for people to adopt it. Here's a little library, import it, start using it, bang, you're ready to go. Um, I, the one that we use, we have a little piece in there that says uh, we can either send out uh, an info, uh, even info, I even go as low as info for some of this, but info, warn, error, um, they'll generate, you can have it generate just a log message directly if you want, but typically it'll do a log message and it'll generate uh, a metric at the same time. Because ultimately we want less code. And unit tests can't just code. It's still part of the, the debt that you incur by having unit tests. So I want less code. <laughs> So unit tests were the best way to ensure quality, but nothing is better than having an active dashboard. When you see that heartbeat and you learn the pulse of your system, that's that's gold, right? You're, um, and it's also like um, like I mentioned here, this is part of that DevOps mindset. You want to see that heartbeat. You want to know how stuff is running. So I run my integration tests against production all the time. Probably every 15 minutes or so, we run a battery test through it. Nothing big. Happy day scenarios. <coughs> Very simple order. You got a couple of things. I mean, there's no load testing. It's not 
hitting it from every angle, it's not trying to get every every little error. This is just like, is it good? Is it working? You know, 80% of the customers are going to do the simplest thing possible. So let's just make sure that works. And that's going to give you your heartbeat. Every 15 minutes, I know what it's supposed to look like. Um, when I'm talking to ops, it's a lot better if I can go back and I can say 10% of the operations that I did had this behavior, as opposed to, this happened to me, <laughs> you know, uh, hand wavy problem that I can uh, not good. Deploy your code using canaries or blue green. Uh, anyone do canaries? I'll swim there in a second if you don't. Okay, blue green. Cool, okay, good. Um, so canaries, uh, if you have a cluster of servers and you're going to take some percentage of, let's say they're all running version 1.0, um, then I'm going to roll out one pod or, or one part of the cluster or a very small percentage of it with version 1.1. And then I'm, I've got tags on all my metrics, so I know, you know what's the error rate of this one versus the other one. So everything's still running, but I've got this one little insidious little piece of code that's over there that will sort of keep an eye on. And if it seems good, then maybe we'll run it down to 20%. Maybe we'll go 50%. Eventually, 1.1 takes over. That's, that's the baseline. Then we bring in 1.2. Uh, Blue-green is another way to do it, where you have, if this is not a, a staging environment. This is two production environments that run side by side. About every 10 or 15 minutes or so, you switch back and forth. So I've got version 1, I've got version 1.1. Now I'm going to go and you're over here for about 10 minutes, see how it's working, go back here for maybe an hour, and then we start changing the percentages back and forth. It's another way to do it. Depends on what your CD environment is like, which one will like work best for you. All the alerts, so when the pager goes off, all the alerts point to a run book. And a run book is a very simple piece of code, or not even a piece of code, a very, a very simple, like a wiki page. And it's got all this critical information in it. This is the stuff, again, three o'clock in the morning, something goes off, you want to find out what's going on. Who are the people on the team? Who are the service experts? Where do I find the dashboard? What are the key metrics that I should be looking at? Um, what are the Slack channels? So Slack channels are, are, are IRC, you know, I don't want to get into it anymore here, but um, <laughs> it doesn't, whichever, it's a great place to start your alerts. You don't have to have pager duty from day one. You can start off when something goes wrong, pump it into an IRC channel. Uh, and then once the noise starts to settle down there, you start to Okay, yeah, this kind of looks good. This is this is a meaningful alert now. Turn it into a page duty alert. Uh, you know, you lose your ticketing system. Where, what's the name of your cluster? What's the name of your Kubernetes um, namespaces? Uh, what's the DNS stuff? You know, all all the stuff that you're going to need. One page. Everyone knows and put it in the alert. So when the alert goes off, there's the URL and you know where to go. Because that's the thing. no one wants to be searching a wiki at three o'clock. So now you start to get out and start learning the meat of the related systems. You know, for, for me, it's the, the G4 layer underneath our application, or the Kubernetes cluster underneath that, or Google Cloud stuff. Uh, I want to learn how what their heartbeats look like. Uh, I want to look at their run books. I want to find out what keeps them up at night. I want to start pushing out of that responsibility. Uh, a couple of things to keep your eye on. These are these are things that are coming down the down down the pipe or down the pipe. <laughs> um, service meshes. Anyone using service meshes? It, it's relatively newish. Um, LingerD, um, Isto, a bunch of different services out there that do it. But basically, what you do is you put a proxy in front of basically everything. And everything channels through this, and they all emit metrics and everything automatically. So if you want to reroute something, you just do it right in LingerD. You don't have to go and change DNS routes or anything. Everything just happens that way. So you put a LingerD in front of your database, you put a LingerD in front of your your other services, and then you can change stuff. And if you want to enable uh, TLS right across the, the enterprise, bang, do it. Um, of course, the risk, the ops people I can see are cringing. Um, <laughs> now you've got proxy standing up for everything else, and that could be another black hole. So um, it's a little early in this stuff, but there's some really cool developments going on service meshes. meshes. The, the nice thing about it is that it means less telemetry code in your code. Again, less code is good. So I don't have to put those explicit things uh, for emitting metrics and stuff actually in my code. I can let the service mesh take care of it. And again, chat ops. Um, IRC, Slack, HipChat, whatever. Uh, they all have ops. They all have integrations. So basically, you take a lot of your batch routines and stuff, and you move them in there. That way, everyone can see what you're doing. It's, you know, 
I always ask for an incantation when someone you know does something. I say, well, what's the incantation for doing that? And I put it in my spell book. That all moves, once you get into chat ops, that all sort of moves into there. And everyone can see what those operations look like and stuff. It's not, you're, you're not protecting your hide by having your little secret stash of bash groups. Um, put it out where everyone can see it. And, and these tools are great for doing that. So, looks like a lot more work. But not, like I say, these things are out there. It's, just, it's as simple as a logging service. Um, like if you if you can write a, a log entry and setting up log services are actually kind of a pain in the butt. I mean, it, yeah, it's easy to enter enter a log entry, you know, say warn and then some values and stuff. But um, to actually roll up all those logs and all that other stuff and, and configure a logging system properly so that it's consistent across services, it's a bit of a bit of a pain. But once you've got it up and running, um, super simple to do. So you can add telemetry very easily. Uh, I love this quote from Ed Keys. This is about 10 years ago he said this. Uh, any sufficiently advanced monitoring is indistinguishable from testing. And so far it's been working out. It's been pretty true. <laughs> no, no pitchforks yet. All right, good. So three more questions. I'm sticking with my unit tests. Uh, all right, going. I think our system could benefit from more observers. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. The middle of the day. Cool. I think we're on. Oh, you're perfect. Yeah. We're in there. Questions? Um, you, uh, you know, you said that the the elk stack was a very common thing, and, and then you kind of mentioned that there were alternatives. Are there any any alternatives you recommend specifically, or? Um. So the question was, what are the alternatives to an Elk stack? Um, the Google Stack Driver one is pretty awesome. Okay. Uh, AWS has one. I forget the name of it. We just did a big migration from Amazon to Google Cloud, uh, and then we really ramped up our web tree on the Google Cloud side. So I'm not familiar with what it is on the Amazon side. Uh, I think Splunk and Datadog and Logly and all these guys are all moving in that space as well. They're all, they're cool. all going to be offering this structure. If, if they don't have them now, they will be very soon. Nice. Yeah. In your slide deck, you talk about refactoring, but I don't think you answered the problem of how does monitoring help with the refactoring problem. So when I look at UTEST, I think about your real-time feedback and making a change, I'm introducing a regression. I will know that in this methodology until I push it to a staging environment. Right. Yeah. Good, good point. So the, que the question was, is um, um, Unit tests are good for refactoring, and now I have to push to production or staging as I'm going to see that. And you're right, you do. Um, but get good at pushing into staging, right? Because that's <laughs> roll back. We, yeah, yeah, and roll back, right? <laughs> and focus those unit tests, you know, for local de de development, is fine on the stuff that matters. So that, that gnarly little piece of code that bothers everyone. Every service has got this little gem inside of it. And if you scrape through all the crop, there's always that little gem of what that service actually does. And there's always one little nestled away piece of code that Bob wrote five years ago and no one can remember how it works, right? That's the stuff that needs a unit test. And that's the stuff that you have to work a couple of directions. But other than that, roll it out. And let the areas and stuff to figure. Yeah. So are you assuming that your staging has all the same monitoring and alerting? Yeah. That's, uh, that's that, that's right, yes. Uh, and we're a little bit lucky because once you get into a Kubernetes type environment uh, or some sort of container management system, it's it's a lot easier to reproduce those things. But if you're using Terraform or if you're using some sort of CD system, you know, Ansible, Puppet, whatever, and you can roll out these environments easier to keep them consistent, then rolling out uh, a monitoring system on top of it is really not a big deal. Uh, especially if it's a hosted service. It's typically just another project. So if I go into this one here, I, you know, I've got my production system, I've got my staging system, exact same monitoring, exact same dashboards, so it's just on that. Huge, huge. Um, so the question was, do we see more incidents? And yeah, absolutely. There's, there's stuff that, and, and especially when we migrated from Amazon to Google, uh, there just, I know the code worked, so nothing, the code didn't change, and 
and just move to Amazon and Google, it should still work. And it failed horribly in a, in a ton of different ways. Uh, all those things were identified from our, you know, the database was over overloaded because the default instance was smaller on Google. Um, uh, so our M MTUs were set too small on Blinkerd, so stuff started failing, uh, talking to other services. So all these things that were outside of my world were causing the application to fail, and monitoring was the stuff that went to find them. So is the speed that you get to production the trade-off that you get your speed customer like that? Uh, for, for us it is. Um, I, I think that customers have a little bit more I think they're a little bit more welcoming to it if you can talk to them proactively and say, we have a problem. We have a status page on our stuff and we update the status page and something else wrong. So if we can if we can do that quickly and say, something's up, all right, we're in a yellow condition now, we're not in a green condition, then customers are receptive to that. Um, I don't think you can have to keep the bodies buried under the carpet, you know. I think you, customers are pretty resilient to it if, if you're awesome. You're model community. <laughs> How do you deal with an uh, environment that you don't have any control, like desktop application? Um, yeah, and this, uh, I'm a distributed systems programmer, and I, I, I'm curious, and I'd love to get feedback from everyone after the fact, um, how well this would work for mobile development, or for a front-end developer working in React, or that, my gut sort of says it should all still work fine, but, um, a desktop application should be able to admit telemetry as well. Depends on if it's firewalled out and stuff. And if it is, then there's nothing you can do with it. Um, if it's a black box and you can't touch the desktop application, you can probably look at the proxy things and just look at the, that layer, the network layer, and see what you can inject in there. Um, but sometimes you just shut up block. There's just nothing you can do about it. For one more question. Yep. Well, No. Have you seen it right now? <laughs> yeah. uh, well, I'm on call right now, so uh, it, it's it's better. Uh, I mean, there are more. You get woke up more, but uh, it, again, I'd rather me get woke up than my boss wake me up. So, and stuff gets fixed faster. Otherwise, I I go back down my little rabbit hole and work on some cool feature that I want to do instead of fixing the thing that matters, which is. That's the nature of the on call. Cool. All right. Good. Thank you. One follow up question. Oh. Is it that you're just getting woke up more because now the developers are on call and the operations were the ones being woke up before? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Nor I mean, we would go on call anyway, and we, so there's probably about eight projects on our in our team. Um, and we have about, let's say, eight services that we have to monitor. So when we're on call, we're on call for all of them. And um, so we're used to getting woke up, but then we usually just had to go over, historically what happens, we would go over and then talk to us and say, things are bad, you know, what's going on? And But now we can go back and say, we've eliminated all these things, we know it has to be something you know, on the side of the fence. Um, yeah. It's, that is a trade off. Well, I've, I've just seen it like from the operations background when developers start complaining about something, it's like, yeah, we know. Yeah. But you guys haven't fixed it for us, so. Right. Yeah, I, you yeah. know, I, I totally get the animosity. And the, I was going to put, I was gonna put a, a slide in there before that said uh, uh, DevOps because everyone should be grumpy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, like, if, if I'm an operations person, I totally get the animosity. It's, you know, it, when something is just constantly buzzing and stuff and, and you've got this other group that can help you and the two are separated, I'd be kicked off too. So. I think too it's just a visibility thing, right? Like developers don't necessarily know what's been going wrong, but when, when your phone is the one that's going off, then it's an awareness. Yeah. Responsibility alignment. At least it's the person who can fix it. The people who are up there. Yeah. Right. And that's really the, the DevOps thing, right? It's, we're all in this together. So. Thanks. Thanks.